good morning everybody uh, and welcome to the young physicians forum of the ceylon college of physicians the second for this year we have uh, two speakers uh, dr neomal de silva who is a senior registrar in endocrinology of the university medical unit who is going to speak first on insulin a hundred year journey i would like to invite dr neomal de silva uh, to speak to uh, do the first uh, part of the young physicians forum over to you dr silva Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, and all the senior consultants uh, and all my dear colleagues. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ceylon College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity uh, to be in this forum. Uh, so, today I will be talking uh, about uh, insulin, a 100-year journey. Uh, so, as you know, this year marks uh, the 100 years since the initial uh, discovery of insulin. So, I thought it would be a uh, uh, proper uh, opportunity to talk about insulin and how it has progressed uh, since that initial discovery. Uh, so this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first I will be talking about the structure and physiology in very brief and uh, then something about the history of insulin and then about animal and human recombinant insulin and then about the rapid acting analogs as well as the long acting analogs uh, available to us and then the premix insulin and then something about the biosimilars and then technology in insulin delivery with regard to the future of insulin therapy. Uh, so first, if we go to the structure and physiology, uh, so as you can see, uh, insulin is a polypeptide chain. Initially, uh, this is actually a single uh, chain, but when the C peptide is cleaved off, uh, it becomes two chains, uh, A chain and the B chain, and they are combined uh, by two disulfide bonds in interchain and one intrachain disulfide bond. Uh, and this is the most important uh, thing we need to realize, the, that insulin exists as a hexamer. So when it is released uh, from the pancreatic beta cells to the bloodstream, uh, they disintegrate into monomers. And these monomers are the biologically active form and they exert all the biological effects of insulin. And this is the other concept that we need to understand, that there are two uh, ways in which the insulin is secreted. So there's a basal secretion throughout the day to maintain the fasting blood sugar levels. Uh, and after a meal, there's a uh, postprandial insulin surge uh, to counteract the increased amount of glucose that is entering the body from the GI tract. Uh, so that is the normal physiology. And when in our insulin therapy, we try to mimic this, uh, mimic this as uh, close to the physiological state as much as possible. Uh, so something about the history of insulin, uh, as I mentioned before, insulin was first discovered in 1921 uh, by these four gentlemen. Uh, first one is Dr. Frederick Grant Banting. He was actually a surgeon and uh, was not uh, actually a very successful surgeon because of that he had to work at a university as a demonstrator. Then he stumbled upon the idea of uh, using pancreatic extracts uh, for the treatment of diabetes. And then uh, uh, John James McLeod was a professor of physiology who gave the theoretical uh, background because Dr. Banting did not have any sort of postgraduate qualification, so much theory knowledge uh, regarding experimentation. Uh, then Charles Best was the medical student who helped Dr. Banting, and James Collip uh, was the chemist who uh, helped to purify the insulin. Uh, so uh, I just need to reiterate that the backdrop in which insulin was discovered. Now we consider diabetes to be a manageable chronic condition. However, when the insulin was discovered, a type 1 diabetes especially was a certain death sentence. So there were uh, hundreds and thousands of children dying in wards due to type 1 diabetes. So they were just left in wards because there was nothing else to be done. So this was a real transformation and I think we should be really grateful to all these gentlemen uh, for giving us insulin and for transforming the lives of millions of people. So this is a, a brief timeline of how insulin has evolved. Uh, now I would like to talk about animal and human recombinant insulin. So as we discussed before, uh, initially this Dr. Bantin, they extracted uh, insulin uh, mainly from dogs initially and later cows, pigs, like animals were used uh, to uh, get insulin. However, there were certain issues associated with animal insulin. Uh, one was in risk of infection, especially uh, prion diseases like bovine spinach form encephalopathy, then allergies as well as anti-insulin antibodies, uh, which led to lipoatrophy as well as insulin resistance. Uh, so to, uh, to address this issue, then we had human insulin. Uh, so the recombinant insulin is made uh, from this uh, DNA technology. Uh, so we use bacteria. So in, inside bacteria, you have these pieces of uh, DNA called plasmids. Uh, so we cleave off part of the uh, plasmid and then we insert the human 
gene responsible for insulin production into that plasmid. Then that plasmid is inserted uh, to the bacterium. Then the bacterium obviously divides. Then we have a lot of copies of this human insulin gene which produces insulin. So that is how uh, we got the human insulin. Uh, and then, uh, so now what, is, uh, what are the main issues uh, with human regular insulin? So one thing is, uh, now as I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, when we inject human insulin to the subcutaneous space, since it is a hexamer, it takes some time for it to disintegrate into dimers, and this dimers, uh, dimers and then monomers, this monomers only that will enter the uh, bloodstream and th they will exert the uh, physiological action. Uh, so this process takes some time. Therefore, when we give human insulin from outside, the onset of action is a bit delayed. Uh, so uh, what will happen is then there will be postprandial hyperglycemia. And also, since uh, this uh, molecule is slowly disintegrating and releasing insulin, uh, the duration of action is prolonged. Therefore, uh, after the meal, sometime after, they will get hypoglycemia. But physiologically, the onset of action is very acute, and the duration is very uh, less. Uh, so these are the rapid acting insulin analogs that are available to us, insulin, lispro, aspart, and glulicin. Uh, so uh, mainly a two or three amino acid difference is there. Uh, so now again, this uh, I have mentioned how a regular insulin acts in the subcutaneous space. Uh, it has to disintegrate into monomers to enter the bloodstream. Uh, now, by manipulating this process, uh, we, we have produced these rapid acting analogs. In the rapid acting analogs, because these insulin molecules are kept together by the sink, uh, so the, the bond between the sink and these uh, insulin molecules is very uh, loose in these analogs. Therefore, once you inject it to the subcutaneous space, very rapidly they will disintegrate into monomers, and very rapidly they will enter the blood. Therefore, the onset of action is very quick, and the duration is uh, very much shortened. Therefore, those uh, issues of po immediate postprandial hyperglycemia as well as delayed hypoglycemia are prevented. Uh, now, uh, that is mainly for the insulin as part and Lispro. However, glulicin, other than having that same effect, it also uh, can be formulated as a monomer or dimer. So when we inject the monomer or dimer, then obviously it can very rapidly enter the bloodstream. Uh, so now, uh, in summary, these are the benefits of rapid acting analogs, quicker onset of action, quicker time to peak activity, and shorter duration of action. Uh, so now, physiologically, so this seems like a very good idea because uh, we can mimic the physiology uh, as much as possible. However, this, does this translate to any meaningful clinical benefit? So that is the million dollar question that we are uh, mainly interested about. Uh, so. Evidence for benefit for short-acting analogs, uh, there are multiple studies. So there was this meta-analysis uh, about insulin as part versus regular human insulin used in a basal bolus regime for the treatment of diabetes. So both type 1 and type 2 patients were included. Uh, so their conclusions were mainly there was improvement of HbA1c and uh, postprandial blood glucose. However, hypoglycemia, there was no statistically significant difference. But uh, nocturnal hypoglycemia, there was a significant difference. Then again, there was another Cochrane review, uh, again, which showed a better HbA1c, but then there was a trend towards lesser hypoglycemia and lesser weight gain, but which was not statistically significant. Uh, then we move on to the ultra-rapid acting insulin. So the people thought, uh, now, whether we can have even shorter duration of action and uh, even faster onset of action. So the first ultra-rapid insulin was marketed as Fiasp, uh, Fiasp and uh, that is actually for, for uh, that is from insulin as part. Uh, with addition of two excipients, arginine and niacinamide. So Fiasp has five to six minutes fast onset of action. Uh, so the benefit is, you know, when we give insulin, we are advise patients to take the meals uh, 15 to 30 minutes later. So what will happen if they take the insulin and don't take the meal? Then they can have severe hypoglycemia. So benefit uh, with this preparation is they can have the insulin at the time of starting the meal or even within 20 minutes after starting a meal. So that problem is prevented. So this is the structure of uh, ultra-rapid acting uh, insulin. Uh, so there was this onset one trial which compared this ultra rapid acting insulin uh, to the insulin as part, the rapid acting. Uh, so there was superior HbA1c improvement and superior PPBG uh, and similar hypoglycemia. Then uh, even in the onset two, uh, they evaluated uh, there are also superior postprandial uh, reduction was there. However, hypoglycemia was not very uh, significant. Uh, then we come to the inhalational insulin. So inhalational insulin addresses two issues. One is the main issue with insulin therapy is people are very much afraid of needles. Uh, then the other thing is when you give inhalational insulin, since it goes through the lungs, the onset of action is very quick. And actually inhalational insulin is just uh, human uh, regular insulin, which is uh, formulated as a powder. Uh, since there is, uh, it, it does not go through the subcutaneous space and all, it immediately enters the blood. 
So this seems like a very promising uh, approach to insulin therapy. However, the first inhalation in insulin was later discontinued due to certain issues. Uh, and even the second one, which was approved in 2014, called Afresa, had significant issues, such as decline in pulmonary function, slight increase in incidence of lung cancer, as well as bronchospasm. So because of all these issues, it was not uh, really a commercial success, despite being a very promising concept. So maybe in the future, uh, we might have better preparations. So this is again a summary of the short-acting insulins, human regular insulin, and the Lispro aspart and glulicin, which are rapid-acting, and the ultra-rapid-acting uh, fast uh, insulin aspart and the inhaled human insulin. Uh, and then uh, we move on to the second part, that is the basal insulin secretion. Uh, so intermediate and long-acting analogs. Uh, so first we had this intermediate-acting insulin, or isophane insulin, which we commonly use in our clinical setting. Uh, the, uh, so it is duration of action is 13 to 24 hours, which is longer than human insulin, but it is not sufficient to mimic daily basal insulin release in individuals with severe insulin deficiency. That is because the duration of action may be less than 24 hours. So usually in our practice, we have seen like initially we might start it as a once daily dose, but uh, inevitably uh, when, as the diabetes progresses, we might have to use it as a twice daily dosing. Uh, and the other thing is it is a precipitate with protamine and zinc, so we need to suspend it by rolling uh, before injection. So this is comparison between human regular insulin versus uh, isophane insulin. Uh, so because of this issue, there were uh, other long-acting analogs such as uh, insulin glargine, insulin ditamire, and then glargine 300 uh, concentrated version and degludec, which is the longest acting insulin. Uh, so these are the action curves of different types of insulin. So glargine, what it does is uh, when it is uh, when it enters the subcutaneous space, it undergoes pH-induced precipitation. Therefore, it very slowly releases these monomers into the bloodstream. That's why it has a very prolonged duration of action and very smooth profile. So it almost 24-hour uh, profile is there with glargine. It was first approved in 2000. Uh, and then ditamire, uh, it, uh, the formulation is it comes as a dihexamer. So then it has, uh, it takes a long time for it to disintegrate into dimers and then monomers and also it's uh, profoundly albumin bound. So because of all this reason, it has a longer duration of action. However, compared to glargine, again uh, with ditamire, the duration of action is less. Therefore, even ditamire, you might have to give twice daily. And the other thing is uh, you will have to give a uh, uh, larger dose of ditamire compared to glargine. Uh, and the other uh, benefit of ditamire is injection to injection glycemic variable is greatly reduced. Because uh, uh, as compared to isophane, insulin or glargine, ditamire comes as a, uh, in solution. It is not a precipitate. So the predictability of glycemic response to insulin is better with ditamire. Uh, and uh, then uh, there have been multiple studies which compare these analogs versus the regular isophane insulin. So as you know, we can use basal insulin in two settings. One is now when the patient is on maximum tolerated oral uh, doses, we can add a basal insulin to that regime, which we call the basal oral regime. Uh, or then uh, when the diabetes progresses, we can go for the full basal bolus regime. So in the basal, bo basal oral regime, there was no change in glycemic control with the newer insulins, but there was less hypoglycemia. But if we use it for the basal bolus regime, there was better glycemic control, but no increase in hypoglycemia. So this glargine versus NPH in basal oral regime was compared in this tri to tri target trial, uh, which showed, uh, of course, uh, less hypoglycemia with glargine. And then glargine versus NPH in the basal, uh, basal bolus regime, uh, they showed that there was better HbA1c improvement uh, with glargine in the uh, ba basal bolus regime. Uh, and then, of course, the, the two available analogs, that is ditamire versus glargine, Basically, glycemic efficacy and hypoglycemia were similar for the two, uh, but uh, ditamia there was less weight gain. However, ditamia also needed more injections, site reactions, and dose requirement with ditamia. So those were the pros and cons of ditamia versus glargine. Uh, then we had concentrated insulins uh, because uh, now glargine came as uh, like usually insulin comes in as uh, 300 unit uh, concentration. So uh, they produce a 300 more concentrated version. So the thing with more concentrated versions, it, it is even uh, slower to release. So the duration of action is even prolonged. Uh, so, uh, uh, and the other thing is uh, the glucose lowering effects of U300 at steady state appear to be lower than U100. Uh, so these two preparations are not bioequivalent. Like, I mean, if we are giving uh, a, a volume of uh, insulin in U100, we cannot just give one third of U300 because uh, they are not bioequivalent. Uh, so this is uh, how uh, the concentrated uh, insulins, uh, they have slower absorption. So there was this study comparing glargine 300 versus glargine 100, edition one trial. 
uh, which showed that uh, there was uh, less hypoglycemic uh, control was equal, but there was less nocturnal hypoglycemia with glargin 300 compared to the glargin 100. Uh, so since we have started talking about the concentrated insulins, here I will talk about other concentrated insulins as well. So there are other form uh, formulas of uh, concentrated insulins, uh, such as human regular insulin U500, that is five times the normal. And then uh, U200 formulations of insulin Lispro, the short-acting analog, and insulin Degludec is also available. Uh, so, and the other thing you need to remember is for uh, up to 200, that is U200 uh, Lispro and Degludec, they are bioequivalent uh, to the uh, their 100 unit counterpart. So that is, if we can just give half the volume when you give the more concentrated uh, version. However, uh, for U500 and Y300 preparations, they are not bioequivalent. Uh, and the other thing is U U five hundred. There is an interesting phenomenon that you know it is regular human insulin. So you can use it as bolus because the onset of action is similar to regular human insulin. But since it is more concentrated, the duration of action is prolonged. So the benefit of U five hundred is we can use it for basal therapy as well as bolus therapy. So that is the uh, at least the physiological benefit that they have shown and that has been uh, shown in uh, studies as well. So this is summary of the concentrated insulins. So basically, two hundred unit uh, preparation of Lispro and Degludec, and then uh, insulin glargin 300 and human regular insulin 500. Uh, then Degludec was approved by the FDA in 2015. That is the longest acting insulin available to us. Uh, the duration of action may be up to 42 hours. Uh, so the Degludec comes as multi hexamers so it has to uh, dissociate into these dimers and monomers to exert its action. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it has a very flat air profile. So the efficacy and safety of Degludec was uh, uh, evaluated in this study, in this NEJM article, uh, DEVOT study, which showed that non-inferior CV outcomes, and there was less hypoglycemia and equal glycemic control uh, with Degludec. Uh, so evolution in a, a nutshell, uh, so if we give a summary, uh, be, be, if we compare glargin 100 to uh, Ditamir versus NPH, there was similar HbA1c and less hypoglycemia with basal oral and lower HbA1c with similar hypoglycemia when we used for basal bolus. And glargin 100 versus Ditamir, there was more weight gain. Uh, and long-acting analogs, uh, glargin 300 had the similar HbA1c but less hypoglycemia. Degludec main benefit was less hypoglycemia. So this is again a summary of the basal insulins, so starting with intermediate acting NPH, and then glargin, ditami, and degdulac. Uh, so then uh, the other issue with insulin therapy is now, you, you know, when we give this uh, basal bolus therapy, we might have to give about four injections, uh, which pa patients really don't like. Uh, therefore, they thought of combining a basal insulin and a bolus insulin, and then giving it as two times daily. Uh, so uh, the, these insulin preparations, they may be human regular insulin with NPH insulin, or it may be a mixture of analogs. Uh, so premix insulin, uh, usually there is 70% of NPH with 30% human regular insulin. So we have to give it about 30 minutes before the meals. And this uh, rapid uh, then premix analogs, usually Lispro with this protamin suspense. So Lispro is the short acti uh, acting counterpart and protamin suspension of Lispro is the long acting version. Uh, uh, similarly, Aspart uh, also has a, uh, the short acting analog. It has protamin suspension, which is long acting. So this is the analog, analog uh, mixtures we have. Then again, there is a mixture of Degludec and Aspart. Degludec is that longest acting insulin which we talk about, and it is combined with Aspart. Um, so then when we talk about uh, premix insulins, they are well established for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. How, however, the thing with premix insulins, we cannot change the, uh, the bolus dose according to the meal and patient's requirements. So this is ideal for patients who have very regular meal patterns and very regular uh, the, the times of taking meals. Otherwise, they can have say, hypoglycemia and certain issues. And the other thing is uh, now, uh, as you know, these pre uh, analog versions are much more costly compared to the human insulin. Uh, however, if we compare the premix analogs versus the premix insulin, main, bene main benefit was in the postprandial blood glucose reduction. So HbA1c and fasting blood sugar, they were almost similar. Uh, so the only benefit is in postprandial blood, uh, blood glucose reduction uh, when we get the premix analogs. Uh, and then the other thing is short acting and intermediate uh, combination like the what we use. Uh, the one issue is midday hypoglycemia and uh, post-lunch hyperglycemia because if we give something like mixed start twice daily, it does not cover the lunch because soluble insulin is no soluble insulin component to cover the lunch. So they can have post-lunch hyperglycemia. So the ideal combination would be a basal and rapid acting. Uh, so now this is again a summary of the premix insulin available to us. 
uh, and uh, then uh, the other the other uh, main issue with insulin therapy is the cost uh, as we know the analogs are much costly and even human regular insulin is costly so uh, to address that uh, they develop these biosimilars that is uh, like the uh, generic drugs so after the patent period is over they make these biosimilar drugs uh, so they have uh, helped to make insulin therapy more affordable because cost is uh, again major issue in insulin therapy uh, then when we talk about the technology in insulin delivery, uh, now despite advances in technology, insulin therapy is a very cumbersome business because patients need to monitor their blood sugar levels, then they need to inject insulin three or four times a day. So that is a very cumbersome business. Uh, so to uh, counteract that, uh, the future we hope will be something like artificial pa pancreas where there is a self blood glucose monitoring and there is a insulin pump, pump uh, which uh, gives insulin according to the blood sugar values. So they will have uh, these other parameters like timing range, etc. Uh, so this uh, new uh, uh, new hybrid closed loop system such as this uh, T-Slim X2 uh, now has been approved by the FDA. So that is one uh, thing that is uh, coming in the future. And then uh, the other thing is the main other issue with the insulin is ins ne uh, needle, needle phobia. So we have uh, come across needle less insulin uh, which actually uses a uh, high pressure insulin jet because in the skin uh, you know there are micro pores so they use these pores for the insulin to uh, get into the subcutaneous space so this is another uh, promising uh, thing for the future uh, so anyway so uh, my main summary uh, is now we have uh, since the inception we have very different forms of insulin uh, including rapid acting analogs and long acting analogs and premix insulins however when we use insulin we need to consider the patient circumstances and especially we are in a uh, resource limited setting so we need to see uh, whether the patient really needs a more costly versions however there may be certain selected patients such as type 1 patients and patients who have sort of brittle diabetes who might benefit from these long acting analogs and short acting analogs but for the majority of our patients if they can be managed with less costly options I think that would be the best uh, considering our uh, healthcare system and uh, our uh, resource limited setting. Uh, and in the future, we can hope for this uh, better uh, artificial pancreas and all these new technologies uh, might make the insulin therapy better. Uh, so these are my references and I would like to thank my consultant, Dr. Prasad Kautland and Dr. Manal Kusumanitil and Dr. Sivadasha Padmadadan and all my colleagues, my uh, other uh, senior registrars uh, and Ceylon College of Physicians and all of you for, for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. T. Silva. That was a very informative and interesting presentation. We have time for some questions, if there are any from the audience. Any questions? I wonder whether I can ask a question. Um, these uh, percentage mixers, the mixed insulins, what is the basis for the for the determination of the percentage? So some are 30, 70, some are 50, 50, and how do you use them uh, to their best effect? Uh, yes, sir. so now ideally, sir, when we uh, like take the total insulin requirement of a patient, so what they actually, uh, usually they recommend is to have 50% of that as the basal component and 50% as the bolus component. So I think that would be the ideal approach, sir. but uh, usually in what we have, like so we use the mixed art. So they are there 70% of uh, basal component. So that might actually not be the ideal thing because if we go by the physiology, mm. what they recommend is to have 50-50 basal and bolus uh, regime. Uh, so I think that might be a better option, sir, considering the uh, insulin requirements. But do you uh, use different percentage mixes for different purposes? That's uh, what yes, sir. in in, in uh, clinical practice, uh, usually no, sir. Hmm. Uh, because in any way, uh, these things are in the government sector that is not available to us. True. Uh, so usually we have to uh, do with the like uh, mix start for the uh, pre-mix and the isoprene and soluble insulin. Sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually uh, we go by that, but that then again they, it has the problem of this. Sometimes we have to add soluble insulin before the lunch because that there is no soluble insulin to cover uh, the lunch components. Yeah. Thank you. Just a minute, the microphone is here. I think just on the same line uh, that you had, uh, because I think these people might not have much uh, practical experience, but. Um, it depends each patient is different so some patients you might you know if you give the uh, long acting uh, insulin 70 percent he might get subsequent high post but mm -hmm. higher post uh, which might not uh, ultimately result in a better hba1c so based on each one and i think a lot of uh, self-monitor smbg 
coupled with insulin therapy is where you can get the best uh, outcome okay any other questions from the audience it's a very interesting topic and a very timely and uh, useful uh, thing for all of us to know about it is always confusing but i think prasad you also pointed out that uh, you have to balance it out for individual patients but i presume there is no a uh, standard method of knowing which one will work for which person you have to experiment and see so that's that's good to know that there is no there is no guidance that you can use to try to determine which type of insulin to use um any other questions so in the absence of any questions uh, i will i take pleasure in thanking the speaker and his trainer also for training him well uh, prasad thank you and uh, we are very grateful for you to have spent your time uh, i have a small certificate it's here in appreciation thank you sir